All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to Brown Skin, the clear and uncut conversations about us. Today's guest is Dr. Camila Marie. And I'm like, I, I keep hearing, is that the feedback? I was like, wait, is that me? You know, I've been screwing up over here. Dr. Camila Marie. So thank you for coming on. I truly appreciate you. Um, for those of you who don't know, she is the host of Pivot and Bloom. So you guys make sure you check that out on all uh, social media platforms. Pivot and Bloom. All right. So let me get into what I want to talk about. I seen on one of your platforms where you were talking about uh, we can heal the body naturally. Mm -hmm. Let's 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 just let's get into it. Okay. So tell me, like, when you were talking about you can heal the body naturally. Okay, let me start this way. Let me start off this way. I'm trying to turn everything down at the same time too. Um, <laughs> you were saying how, okay, being in the medical field. And, you know, there's a lot of money in the um, the people that used to bring us the food all the time. Um, look, the, look, the people that used to bring us the food, the part I enjoyed about it. Uh, what representatives, what are they, the reps, drug reps? Oh, drug reps, pharmaceutical reps, yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're drug reps. So, you know, and yeah, could I have gotten into it? Absolutely. But me personally, I'm, I'm just going to be honest, I felt like... I was doing a disservice to the people mm -hmm. and that that's just me. And I mm -hmm. said, I can't do that. I want to help people, but I just can't, um, hope sell something for you to give to people or to use on people that I know that I wouldn't actually use. Mm -hmm. Now I have a son and I remember telling him, I was like, you need to get a job. You know, everybody's first job was at McDonald's, blah, 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 blah. And he's always been, health conscious always always mm -hmm. always and he was like I'm not gonna work there and I was mm -hmm. like what do you mean you're not gonna work there he was like I he was like mommy I will tell the people don't eat this do you know how long it lasts do you know how long it lasts before it goes bad he was like I'm not eating it so I'm not gonna I was like don't even do it you know so I was okay <laughs> with that I was like okay well I don't want you to do that yeah. but I reflected back on me with the pharmaceutical reps and it looked like an easy job just going on in and they making big money to cohorts or to convince people to use this product and I'm just got I gotta put it out there clear and uncut that they don't even use mm -hmm. and it's like do you even know anything about this do you know how it's affecting the body you know because some of the people that are drug reps the ones that I know the medical background they that they have is that training to be mm -hmm. a drug rep mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't know that so when you actually Said something, like I said, I can't remember which platform it was on, but I was watching it and I was watching it at work. So that's why I couldn't watch it all, <laughs> all the way, see it all the way through. But it caught, it caught my you know, attention. I was like, let's talk. Yeah. So. All right. Go ahead. The, the floor is yours, honey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am um, Dr. Camila Williams. I am a family physician by training, board service. I um, recently left my so-called nine-to-five job due to family practice in, in order to pursue holistic health, wellness, and healing. So um, I am the host and creator of Pivot and Bloom podcast, which is all about the cycle of transformation and wellness. And um, it is born out of my passion for wellness and helping people to heal naturally and in God's way. So that's how I ended up here. I just recently left my job about three weeks ago. So um, it's a brand new adjustment, but I'm, I'm stepping fully into that, uh, that purpose that God has given me. So that's how I ended up here. But did you want me to talk about the, um, you know, my, my take on the medications or? Yeah, you know, I want you to, but I wanted you to give that information. I didn't want to put it out there because, you know, okay. I'm always about following your dream. That's yeah. what I live for. That's what my platform is to encourage, motivate, and inspire people to do whatever it is that they want to do as long as they're not hurting other people. Yeah. Okay. So be great. I didn't want to put out there like, listen, yes, she is a medical doctor. She is not, you know, she, <laughs> you know, like, you know, everybody throw the doctor up front, boom, boom, boom. She's a, actually a medical doctor who said, okay, hold on stethoscope. I'm going to set you right here for a second. <laughs> and I'm going to follow my passion and my dream on health mm -hmm. and wellness. So thanks again. Where are my sound effects at? I need my sound effects. 
<laughs> okay, so I want you to um, tell me your take on what I was speaking about as far as like the pharmaceutical reps. Yeah. Um, to be honest, um, they were never my favorite, and I'm not just saying that. Um, I always had this kind of feeling of um, discomfort around them. Um, and, you know, it's not anything against them personally. I've met some very lovely pharmaceutical representatives, but I always felt like they were trying to tell me how to prescribe and what to prescribe. Um, I've even had one tell me, you know, that when I was skeptical of their whatever they were selling. Um, they said, well, don't you want to do what's best for your patient? And I just thought that was very, um, bold, but also very, um, you know, with what you mentioned that limited, uh, education they get, they, they get to know one drug or a few drugs very, very well through a training, which is relatively easy to do. You learn how the medicine works and what it does in the body and so forth. And then they, they sell based on that. And are there medicines that are helpful? Absolutely. There's medicines that have saved lives and I people all the time medicines can be miracles but where we've gone a little um, off the path is where it's become the end-all be-all to treatment to health um, where that's the only option that we're we're given or that we are giving in a lot of cases and um, I just I, it doesn't sit well with me um, as I have gone through my career so um, a lot of people can't believe this but I've actually been a doctor for 18 years And um, I've been in practice for 15 years. And so in that time, I actually have seen medicine change um, where we started out with, you know, 10 or 15 patients a day that would have mostly, you know, acute problems. So things like colds or they have back pain or something like that. Um, And then, you know, you have your few um, what we call frequent flyers, people that would come in all the time with their chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, things like that. Now our our day is 90% or more of that, of chronic disease. There's days that I have seen patients and um, every single patient has high blood pressure. Every single patient has a high blood sugar. Every single patient has one or the other. You know, there's just, the days are varied, but a lot of times some, some kind of pattern like that. And so I noticed that shift and I was like, well, maybe, you know, It's just the population that has, because you kind of, with your personality and the way you practice, you kind of start to attract certain patients. I'm like, maybe it's just that those patients are seeking me out, you know, but it was absolutely alarming. And then when COVID hit um, and I saw the tie between those chronic diseases being the thing that made people, people more susceptible to being sicker with COVID, then I was like, okay, this is going to be a big thing because now... We know that this is a major problem and everybody can't be having these things genetically. We think about, you know, and and we can talk more about that, but we think about it. A lot of times people think, oh, my family has this, my friends have, you know, and or, you know, mostly my friend, my family, or they just think it's normal to have these chronic diseases. But the truth of the matter is more than the actual genetics is we eat and we live like our parents and our kids and, you know, so we're all sharing these same diets and our bodies respond in a similar way. And it just doesn't make sense that all these people would have chronic diseases. And so when it comes to the medications at the point that I'm seeing them, a lot of times they're necessary to save lives. If we don't give them medication, they may have a stroke. They may have something else going on, but a lot of times they're at a point where we can actually reverse that. We can reverse their diabetes, we can reverse their high blood pressure just by changing some things in their eating and their lifestyle. Um, 12% of the American population, so this is American adults, are metabolically healthy, meaning that their cholesterol is where it should be, their blood pressure is where it should be, their blood sugar is where it should be, and their weight or their waist circumference is where it should be. So those, there's like five criteria. Um, The cholesterol has two, the HDL and triglycerides. Um, And only 12% of us actually have all five of those intact. So that just speaks to the amount of people living with chronic diseases that are largely preventable. And so that has driven a lot of my passion, especially when we start talking about our black community. Um, It is absolutely rampant. Um, And so I, I really am motivated by helping people to realize that they can change that. So what would be, if you um, could just speak, to the people, what would be the first thing that you would actually say to change without medication? 
without medication. So, you know, you always want to talk to your doctor. I'm not giving medical advice, but you always want to have a dialogue. I always talk to people about having a productive relationship with your doctor. And if you can't get that, if your doctor is not open to that discussion, then sometimes you may have to find a different doctor that works with you more directly. Um, But the first thing I tell people is to start looking at what they're eating. Now, that can be a very loaded thing because different bodies respond to different foods differently. So um, it's very individual. But if you start to pay attention to what you're feeding yourself on a daily basis, if you just even just wrote down everything you ate for a week, um, you would notice that there's some patterns to that, right? And so chances are, if you have some chronic illnesses, there's probably some tie-in to what you're eating on a regular basis. Um, You may need a professional to help you figure out what that is for you. But if you start to see a pattern, you start to look into what those foods have in them and why your body may be responding negatively to them. So some of the main ones, and this is just a broad overview, but some of the main ones that tend to be problematic that people don't realize are gluten. So wheat and wheat products, breads, things like that. Um, Because we talk about carbs, but there's specific carbs that can be problematic. Um, Sugar is a big one. Sugar is a, we don't need sugar. We don't need carbs really. Um, And that's something a lot of people don't realize. Um, We actually need some healthy fat and protein, but we really don't actually need carbs. They're not always harmful, but we don't have to have them. And so a lot of times people are eating things in that family that are just not great for them. So um, you talk about wheat, you talk about sugar. Um, Another simple one is drinking enough water. Um, we drink a lot of other things. We like flavors. So a lot of times we drink, and I, I went through this, this comes from a very personal place where I drank mostly water. I mean, not most water, mostly pop, um, or, you know, sweet tea or something like that. And drinking water helps our body to get back, back to where it should be. So those are like the main ones. Um, and a, and a side one is that a lot of, um, African Americans have problems with dairy and lactose intolerance. And so that doesn't just show up as a bowel issue. It may show up as fatigue and brain fog, feeling like you can't think clearly, being tired a lot, being anxious or depressed. It can show up in a lot of different ways other than that main way. So those are some quick things to just look at um, and see what's going on. And, And along with that is starting to look at your food labels and see what is actually in those foods, those packaged foods that you're eating frequently. Okay, so we know that... um it's a microwave society. That's what I call it. The old microwave society where everything is rush, rush, rush. So you say, you suggest a food diary. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. That's a great, write it down, make it plain, and you can actually see. And then you don't have to think or make excuses. And it's hard to make excuses when you're the one that's writing everything <laughs> down. And you know you have a problem when you are making excuses with yourself. Your argument is with yourself. Mm-hmm. That's a problem because you're like... Well, um, who, how do you compromise with yourself? That's weird, right? <laughs> but people do it. We do it. That's when, we, that's when you know that you're guilty. Um, if you yeah. have questions, yeah. let me put this phone number out there. 619-902-2287. 619-902-2287. I want to put that out there for the lovely people. Um, now, when you say like the carbs, so the lay person, me, I'm mm-hmm. under the impression carb, some carbs give you energy. Mm-hmm. I've noticed I'm on a no meat may. Now, I don't know, you know, your cousins and them, they like, I just said I wasn't eating meat for May. You know, I said, OK, I can I could do no meat for May. But your cousins and all of them, they want to be put me on a diet and all this other stuff. They got me straight mm-hmm. vegan. Whoa, hold up. Because okay. after look, after May, I might be back out there. <laughs> but, but the reader me, the reader that I am, I have noticed, and I shouldn't be saying this out loud because you know they got people stealing organs and all that other stuff, but I'm just going to say, O positive, I'm O positive, my blood type. So find out your blood type. I've noticed, and this is just me, the thoughts of myself, not of the guests, on brown skin. Um, O positive, there's like um, certain foods that we can digest properly. And I noticed that just from blood type. So like when you were saying that, you know, different bodies react and respond to different things differently. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I'm lactose intolerant, always Mm -hmm. have been. And it's like, okay. And it's not just like the bow or anything, you know, it gives me gas. I get physically sick, nauseated. Don't give me milk. 
because it's not going to work out well and I'm not going to drink it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I noticed like, and this is just me reading, not, you know, total facts. So y'all, y'all look into your own blood type. Mm -hmm. But when I read it, it was called O positive and it was showing the foods that we tolerate well. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, I've always liked vegetables. Always. Mm -hmm. So I am, I don't know, broccoli burger though. So let me put that out there. Don't be sending me that. I don't want no broccoli burger, but I like broccoli. (laughs) I eat the broccoli and meat is hard for me to digest. Mm -hmm. It really is when I do eat it because I feel so bloated and like constipated and just uncomfortable after I eat it. And it takes probably like two to three days before I'm back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I was reading. I was like, oh, this is interesting. When I read that particular book, I was like, oh, so it is something to this blood type or the body. So when you said that, that's it kind of jogged my memory. I remember reading that and I was like, oh, this this is this is something. <laughs> look, I'm like, this is something. There's something to this. That's why. Look. And so me being on no meat may. And when you brought that, you know, when you were talking about it, I was like holistic. We need that. Now, there's mm-hmm. another doctor that I worked with at the ER um, years ago, mm-hmm. um, Form Health, and he was a holistic doctor, and we would talk all the time, and the drug reps used to come in, mm-hmm. and I'm me, the guilty one, I used to be like, listen, I ain't going to say his name. Mm-hmm. I was like, listen, they bring it as lunch. Just listen to them, <laughs> you know, because mm-hmm. they would bring the whole staff lunch, mm-hmm. and now he actually removed himself as well probably about 10 years ago totally holistic but I loved communicating with him and he was saying the same thing so diet one exercise let's talk exercise okay all right go ahead (laughs) so so my take on exercise is um that it is useful but it's not the end all be all and by that I mean A lot of times what we hear when people want to lose, a lot of people just want to, not just, but that's usually what gets people thinking about wellness is wanting to lose weight. And I know that was what got me into it. Um, And we think we hear diet and exercise, diet and exercise. But what we've seen is that typically doesn't really work. And there's multiple reasons why that doesn't, that combination doesn't work is we, you know, and and we can go into like hours on that. But the um, exercise piece is what's most interesting because a lot of times the assumption is that if somebody is having a health problem or somebody has a weight problem and that they are lazy or unmotivated or don't want to move and they're like, oh, just get moving, you know, go out and walk and do those things and you'll lose weight. And the reason that doesn't work is because our bodies are so intricate and dynamic that our bodies are smart. So if you start to eat more or eat a certain way, your body will adjust accordingly, depending on how your body responds to that. And so if you exercise more, same thing. If you exercise more, your body will decrease your metabolism in a way to meet that increased use. So it's kind of like, you know, we think like, oh, if we're burning more, then we're just burning off fat. And in a way that we are, but in another way, our body will kind of adjust how it metabolizes food for the activities that we're doing. So when you go and you're doing these really heavy activities, your body will increase your hunger, will increase your your need for food. And then you kind of get frustrated, right? You're like, well, I'm really hungry, but I'm trying not to eat as much because somebody told me that if I eat less and move more, then I will be good. So exercise is important for our heart health, for our mental health. Um, for fat burning, you know, for our bodies to stay slim and trim and all of that stuff that everybody wants, but it just does not help in the, in the realm of weight loss per se. Um, a lot of people do feel better if they work out, but that's variable too, because if you are having a lot of joint problems or not feeling well, and you go out and you try to like do this, you know, intense workout, you may actually harm yourself because you haven't been doing it. And so it can be a double-edged sword. So um, my personal story about that is that about eight years ago or so, I did um, one year I did a half marathon, and the other year I did Pelotonia, which is a bike um, event, a cycling event here in Columbus, Ohio. And um, it was funny because uh, I was at my heaviest weight during all of that, you know, and continued to gain weight during that. And people say, oh, my gosh, you're doing all this activity, and I had to train for both of those things, but my body was not releasing weight. And so that's what showed me that um, it is not about exercise. But what it is important to do 
is to start to incorporate it. So what I usually tell people to do is to start with small things. So like you don't need an hour or two workout to get a benefit. You really only need to be moving, you know, vigorously for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So like a, a, a hit, what we call a hit workout, high intensity interval training um, will get you there. Um, any kind of like people go out and walk and walking has a lot of benefits outside of just the physical exercise itself. Um, you know, and getting outside is a benefit too. Um, but just anything like that, dancing, a lot of people go line dancing or do Zumba or do things like that. Those are all things that are fun and that help other areas of our wellness, but also contribute to our physical wellness. Um, and if you can incorporate that into your week, um, you will be fine with that. Um, you want to build muscle and burn fat. So the more muscle we have, the more fat we can burn. But it is a balance, you know, so you might want to lift some weights. Um, and usually you only need to lift like light weights and things like that when you're doing, you know, do some strength training. Um, I tend to do maybe 20 to 30 minutes a day. That's usually the most that I do other than my usual activities and things like that. So it really does not have to be anything strenuous or, you know, most of your day to get to get a benefit uh, from exercise. Um, I remember now I used to walk four miles a day. Uh-huh. And when I first started walking, I remember my hands would swell. Mm-hmm. And then I had to pee. So now <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, now I got to go find the bathroom. You know what I mean? Run yeah. look, run down to McDonald's because that's, you know, they got McDonald's like everywhere. <laughs> I'm like, oh, now I got to run to this McDonald's, go to the bathroom and then come back and continue walking. What's the chances of me coming back? Well, I knew what the ultimate goal was. The ultimate goal is I wanted to be fit. Mm -hmm. and healthy. Now, you do have where I went to a Zumba class. I got invited to a Zumba class. Now, follow me. Four miles a day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to this Zumba class. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to the Zumba class. What? I, I needed a starter kit. <laughs> I needed a towel. I needed a spray bottle. I needed everything. Mm -hmm. I was totally out of energy. I could mm -hmm. not hang. And I'm looking and then just like um, like you were saying, you were at your heaviest when you were really working out. Mm -hmm. And I see people that are working out and I in the Zumba class, doing it up, line dance and all that extra stuff. I mean, at every line dance class, but not at their ideal weight, their mm -hmm. ideal weight. OK, so mm -hmm. I want to put that there. Then I saw because it's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. She stopped eating meat. But the problem that I saw, but I'm not one, I'm not judging. I am not the food Nazi. I'm not saying none of that. But I saw she, she would eat more carbs. And what was happening with her doing all of those dances and line dances, but she was eating and she got rid of meat and she's going to do her thing. She got bigger. Mm -hmm. So me being me, I just asked her, I was like, what happened? So she started, she started <laughs> laughing. She's like, what you mean? What happened? I was like, did you eat the gumball? You know, like <laughs> Willy Wonka, if y'all watch Willy Wonka, a little great gumball, you know, did she float? Yeah. Like, what the heck happened? Mm -hmm. And in her situation, she had no idea what happened, got blood work, and guess what? Her, she had a thyroid dysfunction. Uh-huh, yep. So after all, she did all of that stuff because she was tired and she's like, okay, I need to get fit. But she was getting larger and larger. And then she went and we encouraged her. Okay. I encouraged her. But look, we, I say we, cause we got together. We both don't have this <laughs> treatment plan together. Okay. <laughs> and she got her blood work done, thyroid dysfunction. So she really couldn't help, you know, losing weight. And she had hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. So it was yeah. working slower. So she was getting discouraged with the exercise, but her problem was not the exercise and the working out. Her problem was actually metabolic, mel metabolically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to that person? Mm -hmm. Well, thyroid is complicated because thyroid is um, the driver of our metabolism. Um, and so a lot of people do have thyroid issues, but what's interesting is that though it can be genetic, a lot of people get thyroid problems from inflammation. And so our food is a big driver of inflammation. So um, we see a lot of people that, 
either have excess weight or not, when their bodies develop these different thyroid conditions that can cause their metabolism to slow down and cause all kinds of issues. And of course, that needs to be treated for them to feel better. Um, but, you know, just like the thyroid, um, so like one of the thyroid conditions is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, and it turns into, um, you know, hypothyroidism eventually. Um, but it can ca- it's coming from some type of inflammation in the body. And we, we don't always know exactly where this comes from. Um, but a lot of times people that have those types of inflammation from their usually dietary or they have the genetic predisposition, but then their diet influences that, um, then they can develop. And it doesn't mean that everybody that has thyroid problems has a dietary issue, but a lot of times it does play a role. And, and other things cause inflammation too. So you have, you know, stress, lack of sleep, things in our environment, traumas from when we're young, all of those things affect the way that our body responds to its environment. And so um, there are quite a few people, a lot of people that have thyroid problems um, in the in the country and in, in the world, really. Um, it's, it's gotten more common as time has gone on. Too. Yes. So, um, yeah. So it can cause it. But, you know, low thyroid hypothyroidism cause a lot of weight gain, um, sluggish metabolism, you know, feeling tired. It can cause pretty much any symptom in the body, but it's more of a slowing of the body. Whereas hyperthyroidism causes more like anxiety and, you know, increased energy in a way, um, you know, and people can have other symptoms from that. And so it's kind of the opposite, but they're both, um, they both have to be treated. Hyper, that's the bulging eyes. Wendy Williams yeah. has that, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I think it was, yeah. I think she actually said it. Yeah. Almost, yeah. Look, she's not my patient, so I'm not violating <laughs> HIPAA. Look, I think she said that live on her yeah, show. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know that about her. I know she passed out or whatever. A couple years yeah, ago. yeah. And that's what she. That's when she actually was saying okay. that, and then went with the lymphedema with her ankles and all that. But enough of okay. her. Yeah. The um, I want to let's talk diabetes and uh-huh. working out. Mm-hmm. And let's go with understanding type one and type two. So mm-hmm. let's go with type one first, because that kind of, that's kind of like smaller and shorter. <laughs> yeah. So type one, um, and, and these designations have changed. It used to be that type one was called juvenile diabetes. The way we looked at that was people would develop it as children, and it was thought to be also an inflammatory or reaction to a virus or um, something like that. And so what happens is the pancreas secretes insulin, which helps us to get rid of blood sugar. And um, what happens is those cells that, pre- that secrete insulin get destroyed or, ir- you know, inflamed or, dis- you know, basically destroyed. And then that person with type 1 diabetes then has to inject insulin because their body doesn't have enough insulin. Um, as Was that... Was that summarize it pretty well that's, uh-huh. that's type one. So now usually, now with talk. working out with type one mm-hmm. what would be your advice to someone who works out with type one diabetes well you know it, it depends on you have to see how you respond um most people with type one are monitoring their blood sugars more closely more often throughout the day some people have something called a continuous glucose monitor where it watches their blood sugar all day long um, and it helps them to see (laughs) (laughs) Um, what their blood sugar is doing. Um, Typically, exercise would drop the blood sugar some, so you have to be careful with that because it might run low. Um, And so you have to watch that. Um, Most of the time, the the advice is pretty much the same as anyone else. It wouldn't vary necessarily unless you're having, of course, um, problems with your blood sugar being too low, um, then you have to be more careful across the board. But they can do the same things, you know, trying to get that strength training in, um, trying to get some type of um, cardio. Um, and I don't focus on cardio so much because it's it's not as necessary. Those shorter intervals of cardio, like the HIIT training, is perfectly for type 1s. Um, so, yeah, so they don't have to do much different. They just have to be really um, cautious with the blood sugar, making sure that what they're doing um, is not causing it to spike or to drop. Okay. Now, type two, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a type one. Okay. You know, and I um, I end up getting a pump. Mm-hmm. Okay. Be- so you have a, yeah, I got a pump. No. <laughs> Look, just, just for the people to view, the viewers, um, and the pump actually alerts me when mine is low. 
Yes. And I constantly have to tell people, that's why I'm asking you this part, because I'll have to tell people, they're like, oh, well, I don't understand. Why do you have it? And people tend to think that or associate um, diabetes with being overweight. And mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. necessarily true at all. Nope. Not and, for either kind. Right. And they're like, oh, well, you could just um, diet and work out and then you'll be fine. I was like, no, nah, <laughs> I trust and believe if I had an option, I would take that option, you know. Uh, yeah. um, now, with type two, yeah. what would be your um, suggestion? You already said the diary, the food mm -hmm. diary. I'm with that 100 mm percent. -hmm. OK. And so yeah. as far as like um, with the exercise, with the type type two with a morbidly obese, let me be specific. Mm -hmm. Let me give you specific. Mm -hmm. Morbidly obese patient. Okay. So what I would say first about that is, like you mentioned, it's important to point out that, that a lot of times we tie health to weight, and it's just not, not really a correlation. We know that people have um, lower lifespans or decreased lifespans with increased weight, but they also increase lifespans with low weight. So there's something to be said for both. Um, I see quite a bit of people in general, not just patients, but just in general, you cannot look at, you know, these talk about HIV. You can't look at somebody until they have HIV. You cannot look at someone until they have diabetes or hypertension or any of that. Um, it's happening younger and younger. So there's people in their 20s that have it um, just as much as people in their 70s and 80s. I mean, so it's the board. Um, but as far as that uh, person with morbid obesity that has um, diabetes, um, they would have to start out really slow um, because they're already carrying more weight on their body than their body can typically handle, especially when you're looking at, like, you're talking 400, 500, 600 pounds, depending on your height. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot of weight to carry around. And what happens is the joints take a hit. Um, the heart takes a hit. So things are a little bit harder. Now, there are some like those that are like linemen in the NFL and people like that that are really physically fit and they're still bigger you know, people, but they still have to be cautious. So um, if you're somebody who doesn't normally work out and you have diabetes, diabetes can definitely help. I mean, exercise can definitely help diabetes. But you want to start out slow. You want to do something that's easy for you to do. It might be lifting. I tell people to sit on and lift cans, you know, cans of whatever you have, you know, cans mm -hmm. of corn or veggies and lift those while you watch TV. Or if you can walk some without a lot of pain, go out and walk, even if it's five minutes, just get used to walking and adding to that over time. Um, interestingly, I have seen quite a few people that have obesity but that do not have diabetes. And so, um, like I said, that's that thing where, you know, they still need to lose weight, but they may not have that particular problem. Um, but they always have to be careful with walking and things. That's really for anyone. I've seen people who are smaller, too, that just aren't used to working out, and they go and try to do a spin class or something really <laughs> key, vigorous, and they just can't do it, and then they get discouraged and they stop. So I would say do something small. I mean, I don't care if it's just walking across your living room. If you haven't been doing that, start doing that, and that'll get you moving a little bit more. Okay. Now, when you brought up um, the increase in thyroid dysfunction, Mm -hmm. And I have seen an increase in it, you know, with different people just mm -hmm. talking. And it's like your basic conversation, the people that's diagnosed with high blood pressure, hypertension, same thing, people. Um, and the thyroid dysfunction and what's and diabetes. It's almost I'm not going to lie to you. I almost feel like. Look at my stuff is just interrupting. I don't even know how to silence this. You hear the ding, ding, and it's like, give me a break. Um, I don't know how to, like, I, I can't fathom it, but I, I just feel, okay, I'll just say it. I feel like is like with this code 462, that's high blood pressure. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like, do people just put the code down and just be like, oh, okay, let me get paid. Like, how is everybody everywhere diagnosed with a chronic care condition like it's so many people more so than not <laughs> um i you know that's something that i noticed 
um, you know, seeing people every day. I just started to see that all the time. You know, um, everybody has a problem. Everybody has a, and I've heard, you know, people in my circle, my friends on social media, people are like, why, why I don't go to the doctor because every time people go to the doctor, they come home with a bunch of medicines and a bunch of diagnoses. And being on that side of things, what I will say that happens is a lot of times people avoid the doctor. Um, they're not, checking on those things. So they don't know their cholesterol. They don't know their blood pressure. They don't know their sh- their blood sugar. And then when they finally do go, it's already gone, you know, and, then, and I won't say far gone because you can really reverse it from any point, but that it's so far gone that they have to be treated where that doctor would be considered um, getting into malpractice if they don't do something. So if you come in and your blood sugar is 400 or 500, I have to do something. If, it's, if your blood pressure is 180 over 110, I have to do something um, or else it's not good for my licensure. I have to do something at that point. Now, I will talk to people sometimes about that. Um, When I was practicing, I would say, you know, um, this is really high. You know, this is what I would recommend. I think you need this medicine. This is why. This is what the medicine does. And then if they decided that they didn't want to take that, then I don't really have control over that. And I say, these are the risks. This is what will happen if you don't take it or what could happen if you don't take it. And I go from there. But for me, that wasn't fulfilling because, like you said, we can do that very well. I got really good at that. (laughs) You know, here's this medicine. I know what to do. I know which one to give you and what to add and all of that. But it never would, even if somebody was completely compliant, they took everything I said, they did everything I said before the holistic piece came into play, um, they would come back and it would still be the same or it might be better controlled, but they have to take this medicine. So forever. um, Yeah, forever. And um, the issue is not that they're addicted to it. It's that now that they've gotten to this point with their blood pressure or their blood sugar, we now have to give them this medicine to sustain that problem. And so it's not that the medicine is causing the problem to stay. It's that now your body's telling us that it's at this point um, and we can't, the only option, and I, I hesitate to say only option, but the only option at that point is medicine. However, If we start to do what we talked about earlier and we're looking at what you're actually eating on a daily basis and how you're moving and what your sleep is like and what your relationships are like and what you went through as a child and all of this stuff, then we can start to get to the root cause of why your body's responding in that way and and hopefully reverse those things. Um, For a lot of people, it doesn't even have to be that deep. They can, you know, oh, I've been drinking pop every day um, and they can get rid of that. The, the thing is that insulin plays a role in a lot of those conditions, those chronic conditions we're seeing. So like diabetes, high blood pressure, gout, um, heart attack, strokes all have a root in insulin and insulin resistance. The gout. Um, I forgot about the gout. <laughs> so those are all things that come from largely from dietary factors, but other factors that that and that's why we're seeing them in alarming rates. So people are like, why does everybody have this? Why does everybody have that? You can trace it back to the way our bodies um, store and or, or respond to or secrete insulin. Um, and so we talked before about how, just to kind of clarify that, we talked before about how a type 1 diabetic doesn't have enough insulin. A type 2 diabetic has too much insulin in a way because their body is secreting more insulin to handle the, the sugar load that they have. So a lot of that is dietary. It's not all dietary, but a lot of it is dietary. And by decreasing your intake of sugar and other refined carbohydrates, starches, breads, things like that, your body doesn't have to make as much insulin. And what insulin tells your body to do is to store. So if you have a lot of insulin, your body is in storage mode. If the insulin level drops, your body is in fat burning mode. Um, and so the more it's in that storage mode, the more you're gaining weight. And it does a lot of other things that cause those other chronic conditions. So that is why a lot of people have uh, or come to the doctor and leave with all the medicines and the conditions that they have. Yes, I did. I got a, I guess, a comment that mm-hmm. says that they don't go to the doc. Pretty much, I'm paraphrasing. They don't <laughs> go to the doctor because they leave with a prescription that has a bunch of side effects that cause other yep. issues. Yep. Yes. And that is a common thing, too. Um, And it's something to me. I mean, I'm pretty transparent about it. It was something that kind of started to um, make me feel disillusioned with medicine because 
um, we come up with medicines for all these different conditions, but we don't, we don't, we don't embrace the nutrition side. We don't embrace the lifestyle side of things. And, you know, to be honest, we're not taught that doctors are taught to treat stuff and not to do the nutrition lifestyle aspect of it. So, um, we are there with, with open hearts thinking we're helping, you know, as much as we can. So every, most doctors are really truly trying to help, Mm -hmm. but, um, the, when that's your only tool and the toolkit is medicine, it's a kind of a turnoff for people, you know, and they see that and they're like, well, I don't want to have to take that medicine. And then they don't come back or they say they're taking it and they don't take it and so forth. But, um, like I said, I think there's definitely a role for it. Um, but then there's a lot of side effects. There's a lot of things that can happen, with these medications. And so I always tell people like, please don't stop taking your medicine. If your doctor says to take something, work with him or her on a good plan for you. Cause a lot of times you do need it by the time they're offering it to you. But unfortunately there's those side effects that come with it. There's not a medicine out there that comes without a potential side effect. Um, and that's the unfortunate thing. Okay. Now what would you suggest regarding, you know, Regarding, I'm trying to be careful, but I mean, you know, <laughs> still in the medical field, um, with your chronic care patients, and you did say at the beginning, let me put this out here too, you did say that uh, medicine has performed miracles. Mm-hmm. And with, let's say, hypertension, high blood pressure, you're taking the medication, the medication, your blood pressure is controlled now. Mm-hmm. And And our mind, you know, is being programmed and groomed. It's like, okay, once you're on high blood pressure medication, and this tells you how far back it goes, um, you never can get off. You hear that. Mm -hmm. Um, Me personally, it's just my opinion. I think it's a myth. Yeah. But um, don't just abruptly cut, you know, stop your blood pressure medication. Yeah. Now, you do have those people who... um, Medicate themselves as needed, <laughs> mm-hmm. the, you know, the chronic care, chronic care patients who medicate themselves as needed. <laughs> yeah. um, I have my thoughts on that. And I just think that you need to contact your primary care physician and let them know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Because I have seen where they blame the doctor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when you say... Um, you can treat yourself holistically. What I'm gathering is that once you find out what the root problem or what's causing these stressors or stresses to cause you to become ill and you address them, then you can be healed. Am Mm -hmm. I, am I right or wrong? Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's getting, it's really getting to the root because by doing the medications, um, while they may be necessary, what we're doing is saying, okay, your blood pressure is high. So let's give you this medicine to bring your blood pressure down. But if your blood pressure is high because your job is stressful or your relationship is on the rocks or your kids are stressing you out or whatever it is, um, we cannot heal that problem with medication. So we can um, improve the blood pressure. And by improving the blood pressure, what we're doing is decreasing your risk of having a stroke or a heart attack. Because if it stays up, then it can cause other problems for your body Um, blood sugar is the same way. If your blood sugar is consistently high, it creates a lot of problems in your body. And so when you are interacting with the medical community, we have to do something to stop that problem from progressing. Okay. But you really want to, and I always equate it to mopping. So like, let's say you turn on a faucet and you let the water run and it's running over the side and you're mopping. That's the medicine side of it. But doing the holistic treatments and things means you may still need the mop, so you may still need the medicine, but by doing this holistically, you're turning off the faucet, you're turning off the source of the problem. So you're going to, okay, I do have this relationship issue, maybe we need counseling, or I need counseling, or I need to change things there, or maybe I need to consider um, changing jobs, or finding how I can be more functional in my job, you know, any of those kind of things. Um, And I know those aren't always um, things we can change, but they're definitely things we can be aware of um, to help change how we are um, functioning, you know, overall. But like you said, um, you know, you definitely have to stay on it if your doctor recommends it because you don't want to risk that stroke or heart attack or thing because your blood pressure is still high. But you can always be looking for those things that you can improve on that might help it to come down. 
thank you. You yeah. spoke about um, the communication with your physician. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you 110%. That I feel like that even with like your pastor. If you can't communicate yeah. with your pastor, you don't see your pastor. Pastor don't talk to you. You need to find a pastor that you can relate to. Yeah. Um, as far as like the physician, you have to be able to communicate with your doctor. And the reason I say that is because so many times I listen to friends of mine mm-hmm. who treat themselves as needed. PRN, treating uh, <laughs> taking blood pressure pills, PRN, then they go to the doctor and it's high and they look at what they prescribe. So I'm just going to just throw something out there. Let's say lisinopril 10 milligrams, Mm -hmm. low Mm -hmm. dose. Okay. And it's like, okay, well you're doing it. You're taking it. What your blood pressure is still high, but you didn't tell the doctor that you just took it this morning and you hadn't taken it for a week. (laughs) So now they increase it because they see up. This is not working. Yep. You know, Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. so when that dialogue is not open, it does cause more harm. And then you want to know why you're in the ER because your blood pressure is so low. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, that is a big problem. Um, I've had something that used to bug me when patients would say it would be, well, I don't want you to be mad at me. And it's like, you know, this is not how this relationship (laughs) works. You have to tell me what's going on, because if I don't know that you can't or won't take this medicine same thing comes up with affordability. If there's a medicine they can't afford, a lot of people would rather just not tell you that um, and not take it or try to take it sometimes. Um, and I often will tell people, um, I'm very open and honest with my patients, and I'll tell them, like, I'd rather you not take it at all than to take it sometimes because you're actually causing more of a problem to take it off and on like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you have to communicate with your doctor. Um, I did a series on this for my church called Your 15 Minutes where we just talked about the patient physician relationship and how to interact with the office. Cause it is medicine is somewhat broken in the sense that things just aren't um, the way they should be in a lot of ways. You know, um, doctors don't have much time with patients. Patients have a lot of costs associated with seeing the doctor in America. Um, there's all kinds of things down the line. We talk about medicines and how much those cost and getting them sometimes, even if you can get them, you know, they may not be covered by your insurance. I mean, it's just all these things. So um, we're trying to close that barrier between doctors and their patients. And especially in the black community, um, black patients tend to um, be distrustful of the medical system for good reason. Um, And so a lot of times, since there's not enough of us black physicians to go around, Um, we have to have those relationships. And I tell people to just really make sure you're talking to your doctor, being open and honest with your doctor. In most cases, they do want to help you, but you may have to help them help you, if that makes sense, to kind of let them know what you can do, what you can't do, why you're not doing it. If I have someone that tells me that, you know, I mean, I tell everybody not to smoke, but if they say, you know, I know I shouldn't smoke, but this is what it is. One thing at a time. Or they say one thing at a time. (laughs) I let it go. You know, they know it's not good for them and we move on and and spend time on something else. So it's so important to let your doctor know if you're not taking it, don't want to take it. You know, unfortunately, there's this kind of push and pull where people feel like, oh, they're going to drop me as a patient or they're going to not like me or not want to deal with me because of this. But, you know, if it's really tense like that, then that may not be the doctor for you. You know, if you're saying, you know, I don't want to take this medicine. And it's it's a tough line to walk because I know being in the traditional medical system, I often ran into that where I knew why people didn't want to take medicine, but there's certain guidelines I have to follow. But at the same time, I can't force a grown adult to take a pill. So, you know, if they say they do not want to take it, then I just document that and we talk about the risks and we move on. And sometimes they'd agree to take it, sometimes not. But I almost always talk to them also about these are some ways that you can change that. You can improve things on the back end so that you can get off of the medicine eventually. So, um, yes, it's communication is key on both ends, the doctor to the patient and the patient to the doctor. OK, so for your coaching, how can they contact you? Um, so I am um, going to be helping uh, Christian single women. Um, lose weight with the ketogenic lifestyle, but in a natural, holistic way. So, um, we wait, are, wait, wait. They only they got to be Christian only. That's what you. They don't have to be Christian. Uh, I'm like, that's just. <laughs> they got to be Christian, single, 
mothers, right? Young mothers? Mm-hmm. Women in general. Women, okay. Um, yeah, so that I, I do that because it is a faith-based program, so mm-hmm. it kind of lets people know up front if that's something that makes them uncomfortable. But, of course, anybody's welcome if they want to um, approach their um, – their weight loss holistically. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be developing programs and content into that end. There'll be people that will work with me directly in in coaching groups. And then there'll be people that, um, you know, interact with the content more so, but um, I I want to help people find that natural way of healing, that natural way of finding things within their lifestyle. And like I said, it's not just your, your actual food, but what your food is prepared in, what your water is, you know, what you carry your water in, all of those things um, affect your health. And so just getting that word out there, having people know um, what that looks like for them individually. Um, so my uh, the way to contact me is through one of my social media accounts usually is the best. Either um, I am Camila Marie MD on Instagram, Mila Marie on uh, Facebook. Uh, or you can reach out to me through Pivot and, at Pivot and Bloom Podcast on Instagram, Pivot and Bloom on Facebook. Um, and those are great ways to get in contact with me if you are interested in that, um, in any of those uh, programs. They are in development, but they should be active and alive here in the next uh, month or two so that uh, people can start working with me. We, we got to get we had to get her up on <laughs> up on and going. I'll have her information on all of my platforms. Also, you can visit the website shop and I'll have the link for Pivot and Bloom. Um, And until she actually gets it going, going on a regular basis, you can uh, please, please listen to previous um, Pivot and Bloom podcast. Very interesting topics. I do want to ask you regarding like for someone who may have uh, medical questions and they want to eventually be off. And like you were saying, you have to address the issues that actually cause it. First, you got to find out what the heck the issues are. Cause most of us don't even know. We just like, yeah. boom, popped up. Like, wait a second. I do know like myself and I just put all my little history out there with hypertension. I noticed that I end up getting high blood pressure working in corrections mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and, and working in it. You know, it's like, oh, okay, well, all is well, but you're constantly on edge mm-hmm. and not realizing that you're on edge, you know, because you're constantly watching your back and it's like, okay. And that's when I was diagnosed and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, the job easy. It's cake. I can, but I am always on protective mode, mm-hmm. always on protective mode. And then you find yourself doing the same thing outside. It's like, okay, I did my eight hit the gate and now I'm outside and I'm still every time I'm in, I'm in a public place. I'm looking around, I'm watching the exits, I'm watching the doors. And I think that that's pretty much it. Then I changed. Mm -hmm. So I did with a little bit, you know, a little bit with the corrections. And then I went to the little people and Mm -hmm. I find myself smiling more because you can't smile there because people will take it as Mm -hmm. you might be trying to come on to somebody or, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? You just got a whole bunch of extra stuff. Oh, she doing her hair today. Who she like? (laughs) Not nobody over here. Okay. You ain't got to worry about that. Like, I like time. I require time, but not doing time. No. So you have that. And then dealing with the school system, I find myself Mm -hmm. smiling more. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wow. And when you say figuring out what the issue is, being at the school with the little people and then being with the adults, if they don't go right in the evening after I leave there, Mm -hmm. I'm able to see. And one time, and I'll share this quick story before we leave off. Um, this little person, she kept coming mm-hmm. and I'm like, Hmm. And it let me know. I was like, no, she, she coming in here frequently. I know I'm all that, but right a minute, you know, she keep coming to visit what's going on. So I talked to the secretary and the secretary let me know both her parents were incarcerated. Mm-hmm. So she needed that extra attention. Yeah. And then when I found out, you know, me, I'm like, ah, I found out who the parents were. Well, guess what? I used to see them. So I would leave, mm-hmm. leave their child. Oh, and then I go cool. and I would see both the parents on different yeah. pods. Mm-hmm. And it, it was so interesting because, and you, of course, you got to maintain confidentiality. I'm not going to ever say anything like that. But it's like mm-hmm. they have a wonderful child and I'm seeing them in there and still very respectful people. You know what I mean? They're in a situation and I'm not one to judge, but their child and they have no idea that your child is suffering Mm -hmm. out here with the grandmother Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And that's why I, I try constantly to tell, you know, tell people all the time. I'm like, listen, every decision, once you become a parent, and I know this is not mm-hmm. what the show is about today, but every time, once you become a parent, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. every decision that you make needs to be based off your child. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. is it going to affect my child? How is it going to, you know, because you might be doing something and not even thinking anything of it. Like, oh, okay, well, we just, uh, it affects the children. They are affected even if you think that they don't know. Mm-hmm. They know. Mm-hmm. So I had to share that incident. But I do want to um, reach out. Is there, do you have a phone number yet? Um, or a call in number or anything like that for your program that you're having? For the podcast? No, I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm not that sophisticated. I'm rushing. <laughs> I'm rushing. No, you want to. I hope to do that though. Like it's pre recorded right now. But yeah, hopefully in the future I can do live shows and stuff. Okay. Look, we live right now. Six one nine nine zero two 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 eight seven. I got the phone number up here, but uh, you see how I do it. I, my my help wasn't here, so I tried to make it happen and really yeah, got you hey, some time. Well, you know, look, you look, I'm like that's when you know the help really is important. <laughs> like they really like yeah. you just sit here, you got the platform. Where's my help yeah. missing? Yeah, look off today. Yes. So um, but if you want to reach out, if you have questions, um, for Doctor Camila Marie. <laughs> inbox me contact me you guys know how to contact me and then i'll reach out and link you up i'm excited about the program i'm mm-hmm. i'm a lady i was born a lady my birth certificate says lady yeah. <laughs> it's a female you know not in change it you can change it up yeah yeah but i'm interested in not really losing weight but healing my body holistically i want mm-hmm. to become holistically healthy yeah and I don't want to be on medication because like the side effects is whack. And sometimes I'm not going to lie to you. This is just my view. So don't, mm-hmm. don't charge it to her. I just, sometimes the disease is better than the side effects. Mm-hmm. And that's me. That's me. <laughs> like, I'm like, that's me talking. So I, I just feel, you know, I'm like, well, I could probably deal with this. If I take this, this, and this, and this mm-hmm. is going to happen. Hold mm-hmm. on. You know, mm-hmm. so I kind of like weigh the options and I'm, I'm very, very big on educating yourself. And Mm -hmm. just like um, Dr. Camila said, you know, everybody responds differently. Every, that's one word, body, not everybody, (laughs) every body responds differently. So, you know, address it and introduce yourself to different things accordingly. Yes. That's it. Any last words? Um, no, that's it. Just I just say, you know, take care of your temple. Um, we only have one life. We only have one body. Um, just cherish it and enjoy your time. Be present. Um, I love the, the piece about parenting because we are responsible for our child's future health as well. So the environment we create for them and the environment we create for ourselves and how we care for our bodies is just absolutely vital to their lives so always think about that as well even if you're not a parent if you are an aunt or you know a grandparent or whatever you know if you have children around um they're watching you so keep that in mind they're always watching like they are listen i was so distracted before we your glasses is fire thank you i was sitting there looking like i wanted to say it, but I'm, I'm, i'm trying to stay focused stay focused stay focused let's do this let's stay focused um when you're available, I'll uh, get with you and mm-hmm. have them, you know, somebody contact you to see when you're available to come on Shop Talk with Mel. Cause, okay. Because cool. I definitely want to talk about this. I really like this. I'm excited about it. Oh, thank and you. And then, I, look, that. probably got those, what's those, you know, the meetings like when people are on drugs, the what's the accountable partner or somebody. Oh, accountability, yeah. Yeah, look, I'm like, okay, them. <laughs> I probably need one of those. Like, what you do? Did you work out today? Did you yeah. eat me today? That yeah, that, yeah, it does because you got to answer to somebody. But I'm, pe- somebody. I'm getting ready to get off here and do my little my walk okay. and close to a bathroom. Look, I'll <laughs> <laughs> probably be like, oh, water, water, water. All right, thank you. Hey, lovely right. people, thank you for tuning in to Brown Skin on every Monday, 4 p.m., only one hour of your time. The call in number, you guys jot it down so. Uh, and just in case I forget it, 619-902-2287, 619-902-2287. Again, 
every Monday to clear and uncut conversations about us. Find you, embrace you, most importantly, always, always love you. Until next week, people, brown skin, right here on your Spreaker.com, Blog Talk Radio, all the podcasts, Let's Shop Talk. Matter of fact, on your favorite podcast, look up Let's Shop Talk and Brown Skin, and you can catch your girl. All right. Peace. Hey, and follow me on all social media at Shop Talk with Mail.